Dear colleagues, I'm pleased to welcome you at Mgemo University today. My name is Andrei Sushintsov, Dean of the School of International Relations. Today is the sixth meeting in a series of lectures on various aspects of the Ukrainian crisis initiated by the School of International Relations. And the subject of our meeting today is an analysis of the interests of a third key player in the unfolding national situation, the People's Republic of China, which is not directly involved in what is happening, but is an important other who is trying to who's trying the current situation in Europe on itself. Whether China wants to or not, it is forced to behave in this unfolding situation in a special way. And today we'll try to analyze this image together with two leading Russian China schools. I'm glad to welcome today Ivan Zuyenko, a senior researcher at the Institute of International Studies at Mgimo University. And we also have with us Vasily Kashin, director of the Center for Comprehensive European and International Studies at the High School of Economics and chief researcher at the, chief, at the Center for Chinese Studies at our university. In the discussion with my dear colleagues, we'll try to cover as many aspects as possible of the Chinese position regarding the crisis we are currently observing and hope that we'll understand whether China will be planning its next steps judiciously or, on the contrary, sharply and impulsively. Moving on to the discussion, I'd like to put it in the following context. We are analyzing Chinese perceptions of reality from the perspective of a country with European culture. Even though Russia's identity is unique and differs a lot from that of Europe, each of us, when crossing the border with an East Asian country, Korean or Chinese, is immediately aware of our closer kinship with Europe. And this is a kind of a wake-up call that makes us realize our own identity. Our perception of Chinese foreign policy is often based on European partners, which are not quite applicable Chinese practices. Either correct me or confirm the above suggestion. The foreign policy process in China has another pace and another rhythm. The images and metaphors which form a special picture of the world as perceived by the Chinese elites are different. In this picture of the world, China is undoubtedly at the center of the universe, just as any any country is at the center of its own universe. Any country may find it strange if another country is at the center of the international processes. Regardless of their size, a country is always at the center of its own universe. The Chinese universe is very distinctive. My first question to both speakers is, how can we assess the Chinese perception of reality around them? To what extent are Chinese assessments of the environment based on the principles of realism? For quite a long time, Chinese foreign policy figures and leading experts have been the main champions of globalization, arguing even more strongly than even American actors that the world is one entity, globalized and invisible, functioning according to uniform rules, that conflict is a misunderstanding and should be excluded from international life. Such assessments continued beyond 2014. Some of my Chinese colleagues said that Russia finds itself in a difficult situation because it is behaving a bit boldly, it challenges the West while China is much more prudent and calm, it is getting more robust at its own pace. China is bound to become a major player in regional politics, and there is no threat that China will have problems like the ones Russia is facing. Russian experts met such statements with skepticism. Eventually, these harsh measures will be applied against China too, regardless of what it does, because the very growth of its power is a threat to the West. Whether China likes it or not, it is becoming a constant that should be adopted too, and the West is not used to it. 
I'd like to begin our discussion with the question, to what extent is Chinese foreign policy based on the principles of realism, or should it be assessed in different terms? I do need other metaphors and images in order to interpret Chinese foreign policy that are not applicable to our Euro European mind. I hope that this question will allow us to understand all the other issues in the context better, and I would uh, like to address the question to Ivan Zuyenko first. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sushintsov, for the introduction. I can agree with most of what has been said. I will start by saying that, in my opinion, it is quite possible to assess Chinese policy from the position of realism, we should only take into account the different speed and the perception of change, uh, and we should also assess a completely different view on a certain dichotomy of East and West, which we often use in our deliberations. Recently I was talking to my Chinese colleague and once again when I used the familiar term, the collective West, the West, my colleague said to me, it's a confrontation with the West for you, uh, but for me it's a confrontation between the Western and Eastern parts of the West. This was the case during the Cold War and it is the case now. This is a rather important remark showing that for China, the current events are, of course, included in the context of the world order, ranging from unipolarity to multipolarity. But for China, it is its own position in this context that is of major importance. In no way uh, does it see this conflict as a conflict between the East and the West, in which its place is definitely with Russia. Of course, uh, the last 40 years of economic success of China were possible due to its integration into the global system. Indeed, China has gained the most from it. Can recall the sanctions of 1989, which Washington imposed on China? Yet they produced no real results because American capital benefited greatly from a situation when China offered cheap labor and allocation to place production. China really thought that this integration into the global world economic system was important not only for China, but also for the West, for the United States. Thus, it thought that rupture would never happen. After 2014, the Chinese really said so, and the trade war announced by Donald Trump in 2018 was a shock to the Chinese. The Chinese did say that they were consistently moving to, towards the position of one of the leaders of the world order, and there was no need to step up efforts on that path. But first in 2018 and now in 2022, China sees that the process, which they had viewed as systemic and consistent, is accelerating, and for China this situation is quite uncomfortable. China would like the status quo that existed before 2022 to last as long as possible, so that China could build up its resources and improve its position. Now China is not ready to take any drastic action. In my view, this explains its hesitancy or, uh, to be more precise, amorphous in taking any particular action. In fact, China is interested in keeping the situation that existed before February 2022 as long as possible. China doesn't want to worsen relations with the United States, nor doesn't want to sour and jeopardize in any way its relations with Russia, or with Ukraine for that matter. We should not forget that Ukraine was quite a working partner for China. China implemented a large number of projects in Ukraine, and China was one of the main buyers of Ukrainian agricultural products. I mean, uh, China would like to maintain all this in some way, but we understand that this is highly unlikely in the current circumstances. Vasily, I'd like to address the same question to you. Now, from some of the steps that the Chinese government is taking, we can see that for the first time it is considering radical scenarios that are comparable 
see what is now happening in Russian-Western relations. And for the first time, we're beginning to hear that China could potentially prepare for a sharp decoupling with the United States, a freezing of its foreign exchange reserves and the seizure of its company's property abroad. For a Russian analyst, it seems that such a large country with the potential to challenge the United States should have been preparing for such scenarios long ago. For a Russian analyst, it seems that such a large country... And so, why do we see it only now? I will specify my question. Are the Chinese elites realists, or do they have the illusion that the globalization will help to avoid these abrupt changes anyway? Thank you very much. If we evaluate the Chinese rhetoric, we should first of all proceed from China's specific internal political structure, the body state and its specific relations with the academic community uh, and the media. One of such specific features is the ability of the top political party leadership to set the tone for the very nature of the discussion on foreign policy topics and to ensure that this discussion takes place along several tracks. In particular, an important feature is the clear distinction between the rhetoric aimed at external and internal audiences. The image of China that wants to follow a liberal, liberal path that is wholeheartedly committed to uh, globalization and sees nothing but good in it, and that views the world situation as beneficial to its development, has been broadcast through all channels and via official Chinese documents uh, to the world for decades. There were specialized groups of people who were responsible for broadcasting this image. This became a particularly pronounced policy after the Tiananmen Square events and the collapse of the USSR when China was left alone with the West and had to keep this relationship at a level where it could continue its own development. But the other line of Chinese ideology, rhetoric and expert publications never disappeared. They saw the situation in a hyper-realistic way strongly influenced by Western strategists and thinkers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries by the history of confrontation between the West European imperialist powers, at least as the Chinese understand it, with, with harsh anti-Western rhetoric. An outside observer always wonders, what is the truth and what is just a fringe opinion? For a long time it has been convenient, including ideologically, especially for the Americans to simply pay attention to those people who said things they liked and ignore those who said things they didn't like. But the situation turned out to be much more complex. Of course, both these trends contributed to the decision-making process and the shaping of the leadership's perspective. Yet, strategically, China saw its relations with the United States and Western countries in the context of an increasing confrontation between their great powers. This 
Who has expressed in its military planning and many aspects of its foreign policy, including the development of relations with Russia, in many aspects of its domestic policies, were gradually and steadily throughout the 90s, the 2000s, uh, 2010s, those defensive nationalist elements were strengthened, as well as the control over various aspects of social and political life. Under Xi Jinping, these trends reached their logical conclusion when the rhetoric changed and the documents began to change too. That is to say, in parallel with the discourse on globalization and China's commitment to globalization, the basic aspects of economic strategy came under review. In the year 2020, this was reflected in the emergence of the concept of double circulation, I mean the development of the country relying mainly on internal development drivers. External ones have an important role to play too, but on the understanding that their role is only subsidiary. Uh, the beginning of the trade war in 2018 was not an irreversible confrontation. However, uh, the year 2020, uh, with its wave of anti-Chinese sanctions, accusations of spreading COVID-19 against China, and early 2021, when genocide charges were added to them, signaled the final change of milestones and uh, the onset of a situation of irreversible confrontation, it was certainly a psychological shock for the Chinese elite formed over 30 years of passive foreign policy and uninterrupted economic growth. Intellectually, many people have probably been aware since the late uh, 2000s and the early 2010s that something like this was going to happen, but context with Chinese counterparts in 2018-2019 gave the impression of déjà vu. This reminds us of Russia in 2014-2015, uh, when people were shocked, they thought, uh, how did this happen to us, fantasized about how they could go back and think like that. I think by the end of 2019, uh, uh, 2020 that had passed. Many of those people from the previous generation who had actually spent their lives broadcasting the image of a radiant liberal China that thinks only about the economy were either forced to change their role or gradually sideline it. The rhetoric started to change and of course China had slightly different strategic interests in this situation of confrontation. It has its own vision of the dynamics of this confrontation. Assessing the Chinese vision, we must proceed from the fact that, from the Chinese point of view, time is definitely working for it. That is, every year China is getting stronger in relation to the other major powers. Yes, its growth rate and is now declining, but is still the highest of the developed countries. Maybe this year, because of COVID-19 and some peculiarities of American statistics, there will be a situation where their growth rates will converge, but this is a short-term moment. The feeling that the further we go forward in time and the more we delay a decisive clash, the better off we will be. Quite many Chinese actions, including a rather cautious stance in the Ukrainian crisis with a clear understanding of who are friends and who are our enemies. Thank you very much. A specific feature of the international situation is that apparently all the big players think that time is on their side. 
a future historian writing about the period uh, of the previous decades will probably say in the opening paragraph of the chapter that everyone believed they were winning. We had a rather extensive discussion in the same room about American policy priorities during this crisis and we tried to decompose the United States as an actor. I'd like to address the same question to you as experts on China. Does it make sense to similarly decompose another actor, the People's Republic of China? Is there some kind of discussion there that is meaningful to external players that can be played on, that can be taken part in? We can see that uh, US experts are looking sorely for cracks in the Chinese position on the special military operation, playing up any voices, however marginal, that speak from critical positions. We can see that China's official position is ambivalent. On the one hand, it admits that the United States and NATO provoked Russia and pushed it to take these drastic steps. On the other hand, it acknowledged the territorial integrity of Ukraine, and these two theses coexist quite closely. How do you describe the People's Republic of China in terms of structuring it as an entity? Are there any groups within the elite that see things differently? Ivan, please, the floor is yours. I'll try, I'll try to answer this question, uh, but first of all, I'd like to point out that China sees no contradiction between understanding that the true causes of the Ukrainian crisis are NATO's expansion to the East and pressure on Russia, and the thesis about the inviolability of borders. In general, uh, the issue of borders is rather complicated and painful for China, because the People's Republic of China does not control all the territory it claims. Therefore, Chinese foreign policy is based on the imperative of preserving the principle of the inviolability of borders which exist after World War uh, II. And in the case of the post-Soviet space in 1991, it is clear why this is happening. If we start redrawing borders, then according to the Chinese, we shall also revise the status of Taiwan. Some kind of global consensus that uh, Taiwan is a province of China and that sooner or later it will be reunited with their mainland is crucial for the PRC. This is why China, while supporting Russia on strategic issues, has not recognized previous, let's say, uh, border changes. For example, China has not recognized the independence of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, the reunification with Crimea, as well as the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. And it is not likely to recognize other territorial changes, if any. There is not much of a contradiction here, nor it is necessary to draw far-reaching conclusions from it. For example, on Chinese maps, the thousand part of the Kuril Islands is marked as Japanese. That has always been the case, and it cannot be seen as a sign that there are problems between China and Russia in their foreign policy, while everything is smooth between China and Japan. The main point is to distinguish between these things. As regards the People's Republic of China, as an entity, again, there are nuances. Anyone who is following Chinese discourse realizes that the debate is real and uh, that views that differ from Chinese mainstream are supported not only by fringe groups or some bloggers, but also by quite competent establishment researchers who may sometimes have views that run a counter to Beijing's guidelines. For example, one of our acquaintances is quite pro-Western and suggests that it would be short-sighted for China to support Russia fully in this conflict, because this cuts off the road to normalizing relations with the West, 
a much more economically and technologically advanced partner, without which China cannot accomplish its task of building a developed socialist state. This requires continued cooperation with the West. According to China, it is crucial not to cut off ways to overcome decoupling. That said, the extent to which these experts influence their decision-making is an open question. It seems to me that one should not take an opinion that fits their experience out of the context and assert anything. Uh, we should be guided more by official statements and documents. We can see from these statements and documents that China is trying hard to distance itself from the conflict, not to limit its room for maneuver, not to quarrel both with the West and with Russia. That said, there is indeed rhetoric to the fact that the United States is to blame for the conflict. The Chinese often say that it is the US, the US that instigated the conflict conflict while Russia just added fuel to the fire. However, uh, it should be understood that China's position on any territorial change is unlikely to change. China will defend its position on the inviolability of borders. Thank you. Vasily, I'd like uh, also uh, to address a question to you. Is the PRC as an entity unified? How likely is a change in position of this ongoing discussion or alternatively in the position codified in the statements of officials? The discussion is taking place to a certain extent in social networks and partly in the media. In general, China has always been characterized by a relative freedom of debates on foreign policy and economic issues. So, it is not surprising that there are some people who are in favor of limiting cooperation with Russia in the context of the Ukrainian crisis. Some people simply support Ukraine. At the same time, we know that China's mainstream media are not allowed to publish negative articles about Russia. Such publications are suppressed, removed if they somehow slip through. There are guidelines on what language should be used in relation to Russian actions in Ukraine, in particular restrictions on the use of the word invasion. There is official rhetoric which, on the one hand, aims not to make China a party to the conflict, if only politically, but, on the other hand, not to insult Russia in any way. At the same time, the rhetorical and legal aspects of China's actions usually differ very clearly from what is being done in practice. Even China's real attitude to the problems of Crimea, Abkhazia and so on has been somewhat different from the stated one. China has made some real contribution to consolidating Russian control over Crimea. In particular, without it, we would not have been able to build an energy bridge to Crimea in 2015. China provided us with a special cable and helped to install it. The position was probably agreed upon at the top political leadership level, and there are no discrepancies. Apparently, it was prepared in advance. I think it is highly likely that the Chinese anticipated what was going to happen, if didn't know exactly. 
до конфликта там, за некоторый период It перевели could not have been otherwise, uh, given that we had converted a huge chunk of our foreign reserves into RBM some time before the conflict and signed an additional oil contract with the Chinese. We should also remember that China is now the second country in the world after the US in terms of space intelligence capabilities, which should have given them a clear picture. We know, for example, from what Americans published that having no real idea about the political component of the Russian plans, they clearly knew that a special military operation would be launched simply because it was impossible to hide it from their technical intelligence capabilities. The Chinese are closing in on the Americans in this respect. So, I think there could have been discussions set an early stage. They are all over, some kind of collective decision was made, and a position was stated. This is a is basically the five-point position that Foreign Minister Wan Yi stated on February the 26th in his online meeting with the European Foreign Ministers, and it hasn't changed much. I don't think the Americans really believe that this position can change either. While it is true that as part of the information war, any Invective against Russia published in China will get good publicity in the West. I think it has a little effect on real policy at the moment. However, especially as China too is being drawn into such a deep confrontation with the US, I'd like to address your attention to the fact that if we go back to 2017, when Trump came to office and the crisis and crisis around North Korea erupted, then Trump found it possible to postpone the start of the trade war with China for a year for the sake of a partial solution to the North Korean nuclear mi missile problem. In 2017, he was repeatedly asked why why aren't you doing anything of what was promised? He said, how come they are helping me with North Korea? But this time, when a decisive role was sought from China and pressuring Russia on the Ukraine problem, no one even thought of making any concessions. All the hostile actions concerning Taiwan continued. Uh, why not put it on hold for a while? Uh, from where uh, on one hand, but apparently there was already an understanding that things had moved to a very different dimension in both US and China and US Russian relation. Vasily, I would like to follow up on that right away and ask you, first of all, to clarify this five point position of the PRC that the foreign minister set out and ask a more general question What could China's calls be in this situation right now? If uh, you could single out, let's say, three main priorities, if you put yourself in these uh, shoes of our friends in Beijing, you will see that the situation is complicated. On the one hand, there is a close economic relationship with the United States, which have been developing for several decades, and momentary severance of these ties would hit the Chinese position very hard. On the other hand, the strategic focus on partnership with Russia, the horizons of these bilateral relations, as one clearly uh, Chinese leader put it, we do not set an upper limit for China-Russia relations. That is to say, no scenarios are ruled out, but on the other hand, in a strategic sense, no party can be happy when it finds itself in a situation where its choices are reduced. When the strategic situation is dictated by external factors and it has to find a role rather than shape the situation proactively. In other words, Russia has put many of its partners and allies in a situation of existing trends, existing circumstances, existing constraints and advise them to find their role there. Perhaps China would have wanted to avoid a number of these circumstances. It didn't 
didn't want them to come so quickly or would not have wanted them to come about due to actions not its own and not initiated by China itself. This has always been a very important parameter. It is a good strategy when you own the initiative. It is a bad one when something happens to you and you have to find yourself in it. What would you see as China's goals? Three top priorities. Maybe they steam from the very five points uh, the Chinese foreign minister set forth. Thank you very much. I think this is a case where the declared five points do not correspond to the real objectives. China is interested and broadcasting the image of a country, a country deeply concerned about what is going on. I think the reality is less clear. The five points boil down to the fact that China was sad about what is happening. The situation in Ukraine is not what it would like to see. China calls for a peaceful solution uh, based on compromise. It calls for respect for the security and territorial integrity of all parties, including Ukraine, of course. But at the same time, it draws attention to the fact that in several Waves of NATO enlargement, Russia's, Russia's position had not been heard. China will make eff every effort for a peaceful settlement of the conflict. At the same time, China draws attention to the fact that within the international organizations and the level of individual uh, countries, actions that will further stimulate the conflict should not be allowed. China believes that universal sanctions fall into this category. The real interests are becoming visible gradually. The first important interest is the element of the conflict that China doesn't like, which is the need to continue to ensure relative autonomy of the EU and its policy towards China. That is, what China doesn't like about this conflict is further political weakening of the EU, its transformation into a junior partner of uh, the US, which will not be able to pursue a separate policy in Asia. This fight for the EU began years ago. The Americans thought to, sought to involve the EU as much as possible in their economic and technological strategy of containing China. They have achieved partial results in this, but only partial far from what they would have wanted. The EU has strengthened oversight over Chinese investments. It has tightened export controls in some areas. Still, at the end of 2021, China was the EU's main trading partner. It continued to develop a large number of areas in off interaction. This is where the Chinese are going to put up a big fight. And this is the effect of the conflict that they do not like. At the same time, it is important to them that Russia should not be defeated in this conflict, because in that case, the vast resources of the United States, military, political, would be constrained in Europe for an indefinite period of time. Of course, this will also change the balance of power in the Asia-Pacific region. The Americans say that they want to see Russia weakened as a result of the conflict, so that it does not pose any threat. But what we see at the moment is that Ukraine needs to get from 5 to 7 billion a month just to function and to cover, cover the budget deficit. It needs to get billions of dollars worth of arms a month. Europe has to bear the enormous cost of maintaining millions of refugees. It has to maintain a huge troop contingent. And there is no end in sight. 
because Russia, for its part, shows no sign of backing down. If this continues, of course, the ability of the US to do something in the Asia-Pacific region cannot remain the same. The amount of resources on that side is limited. That is the strategic effect of this conflict, and it is important for China. It doesn't need Russia's defeat at all. It needs an outcome that will weaken the opponent. And the third important aspect is the changed overall model of China's relations with Russia itself. China's ambassador to Russia, Mr. Zhang Hanghui, uh, has explicitly said that Chinese business should fill the void that the departure of European and other Western companies has left in our country. And it is not just about taking over some segments of the Russian market. It is, about, it is about the fact that Russia, as the world's largest exporter of commodities, will be forced to reorient these exports mainly to China in the coming years. It will supply all of its raw materials to China for the Chinese currency, the yuan, because it is cut off from the Western financial system, and apparently it will supply the commodities at a substantial discount, as it has no alternative comparable markets and via overland routes. In other words, what is happening is the radical strengthening of China's economic security, which greatly reduces the ability of the West and the US to introduce any form of economic warfare against China. This is a significant benefit and a significant gain for the development of the Chinese economy as a whole, particularly for some of its depressed regions such as the North East. Of course, as the infrastructure is created. However, Russia has no choice but to create this infrastructure if we proceed from the fact that the EU has been implementing its plans for several years. So the strategic consequences are very significant and they are positive for the PRC. Another important point, another lesson from the Ukraine crisis. Russia, as we know, the 11th biggest world economy in real terms at current exchange rates and the 6th biggest economy at purchasing power parity. However, sanctions against Russia have led to a sharp rise in inflationary pressures around the world including in, in developed uh, economies. They have negatively affected economic not growth not only in the European Union, uh, but also in the United States. They have caused negative social phenomena in a number of states. And what lesson can we learn from this? A very simple one. To to impose even 20 or 30 percent of the amount of sanctions against Russia on China is completely unimaginable. It will bring about the death of the world economic system as it stands. In fact, it will require all developed economies to take some kind of emergency mobilization measures to save production facilities, because there is not a single complex product in the production chain where China does not play a significant role. And it will turn out to be an economic nightmare. This is what we have seen. It was an unprecedented event, this amount of sanctions against a country of Russia's level. And now we can only imagine the amount of sanctions against a country that has an economy 10 times bigger 
И uh, это тоже важный this вывод, хотя Китай со своей стороны тоже ведет большую подготовительную работу, work. проводятся стресс-тесты, so uh, uh, в реальном времени ежедневно бюллетени, с описанием всех санкций Владимир Путин в России, там эффектов, там огромный объем китайцев высокой работы с открытыми данными, но uh, в целом ну, вывод напрашивается именно is... такой. If this is the effect of sanctions against Russia, you cannot think of applying even one-tenth of sanctions like this against China. Ivan, the same question. Three main priorities, three main goals for China in the current crisis. If you could comment on these three that Vasily suggested, the need to ensure Europe's independence, not to let Russia be defeated in the situation, and to create a new framework for relations with Russia in economic terms. I'd like to start by saying that probably the global goal that China has, not only in the context of this crisis, but in general, is to get the maximum possible position in the, in the transition of the world order from unipolarity to multipolarity. That said, China, as we have said in our discussion, this sees this process as quite long and predominantly peaceful. It really believes that time is playing in China's favor, and this is why its objectives are to remain neutral for as long as possible and not to sue ties. At the same time, it preserves for room for maneuver, maintaining opportunities to strengthen its position, both economically and geopolitically, in Central Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. That is what I would call the main task. It is clear that this is a task that doesn't require action, but rather inaction. Here again, we are ready to delve into the depth of learning about the foundations of Chinese civilization, the Wu Wei principle and so on. I would prefer not to dig so deep, but to note that the absolutely normal and pragmatic position of China is not to get involved as long as possible in conflict situations, as our country has done. Moving on to the uh, second task. It seems to me that the concrete expression of this is the restoration of Beijing's control over the entire territory claimed by the People's Republic of China. In the first place, we are talking about Taiwan, but let us not forget that there are questions about the sovereignty of a number of islands in the South China Sea. There are claimed by several countries, and it is very important to understand that China would like to resolve these issues peacefully. Of course, use of force scenarios are also being worked out. It would be strange if it were otherwise, but in some ideal scenario, optimal for China, Taiwan is reunited with it peacefully because this is consistent with the wishes of the population and consistent with the specialization and complementarity of the economies. And it is it's clear that China will delay taking any tough decision on this issue for as long as possible. The third task I would highlight, and it largely coincides with what Vasily said, is that China understands the weakening of Russia's position as a result of the Ukrainian crisis. It really sees for itself some strategic opportunity to strengthen its position, the position of its capital in the post-Soviet space as a whole, because it is not only about Russia, it is about the fact that uh, the Chinese believe that Russia's influence in Central Asia, and the South Caucasus and so on will diminish. There are several important points to be made. Uh, first of all, we need to understand that Russia is extremely important to China not only as a reliable strategic area, but also as a reliable supply of much-needed commodities, including energy and food. And what is important, as Vasily pointed out, 
I'd also stress uh, that the possibility of overland deliver deliveries is important. Given that China is in envisaging conflict situations mostly in the oceanic waters, it is extremely important that Everything should be reliable in terms of overland supplies of goods and resources. Reliability is indeed ensured in relations with friendly Russia and with regard to China's position as a large capital investor in the post-Soviet space. Energy resources are supplied via pipelines, there is also room for infrastructure development for food supplies. This is already being done and is likely to be stepped up. There is an important nuance here related to how Chinese business and capital are behaving right now. We hear a lot about Chinese companies, one after another, winding down their operations. Uh, problems arise in relation to bank transfers and so on. And I myself have often had to answer the question of why it is happening. Everything seems to suggest that China should be increasing its presence here. I think there is no apparent contradiction here. We should understand that there are Chinese businesses that are closely tied to Western markets at the moment, and they cannot risk losing these markets. An absolutely rational, pragmatic choice which tells us nothing about ideology or bias. Business does what is most profitable to do at the moment. But this does not mean that this is the position of Chinese business in general. Firstly, there are Chinese businesses which are less connected to Western markets, but they are quite capable and effective on the Russian track. Secondly, we can assume that businesses will be created not attributable to Western markets. In simple term, some subsidiaries will supply goods and technologies to Russia. They will not be formally linked to large corporations like Huawei, which does not want to be liable to secondary Western sanctions. It is a plausible scenario, we should also understand that it is a very long, complicated process of coordination. And the second point is that it is a process that requires silence and privacy, and therefore we should not expect some public news that the Russian and Chinese sites have agreed on some algorithm for bypassing the sanctions. Undoubtedly, Russian and Chinese sites will negotiate their way around sanctions using various tools with the help of these businesses and working with other EAEU countries. But this will not be done publicly, instead the media will be writing about companies leaving the market. We have to understand that reality will not be identical with the information agenda. I would identify this as a third task. You made a good point about Beijing's long-term vision of international relations and its perceptions that time is on its side and requires that it should not act but, on the contrary, do nothing, not action but contemplation. An interesting observation, and apparently it is being misinterpreted in Washington now. Right now, in the acute phase of the crisis, the United States is trying to pressure China into joining the anti-Russian sanctions regime. In general, it sees the current economic interdependence between the US and China as a system of dependence in which China is more tied to the United States rather than the two countries being equally tied to each other. And now it is trying to coerce China to provoke it into some drastic steps. My question to both speakers is as follows. Why is the United States now trying to describe its position on Taiwan in a harsher language? Some influential Washington think tanks are publishing recordings of a war game scenario around Taiwan in the form of a TV show. What would happen if China struck Taiwan? What would the United States do? Would the war be local, regional or outright nuclear? Tensions are being built up over all these hot button issues and there is a sense that either the United States is trying to provoke China into making drastic moves 
to take it out of its comfort zone, to present it as a discredited country and thereby break up Chinese regional partnerships. Or uh, it realizes that time is really on China's side and the US has to force China now to play by the rules that the West considers fair within the international system. Because afterwards, it will be too late, China will be creating these rules itself. And the second part of this question is, how will China respond? What is Washington's logic and how will China respond? Vasily, please, the floor is yours. From my point of view, while the Americans retain a sincere belief in the superiority of their system, they realize that in the foreseeable future, China will be getting stronger in relation to them, it will be building up its military power at an accelerated pace, therefore imposing a collision on China terms favorable to the US could be an important objective. At the same time, since from the American point of view, China is a much more important rival than Russia. Uh, the US is not prepared to sacrifice any strategic advantage in deterring China for the sake of confrontation with Russia. One more point. I have had a lot of cons conversations with American security and military experts on China. There is a stereotype. Uh, the Chinese are people who can backtrack at the last moment. It is an image uh, that has been shaped by Chinese politics since the advent of the era of reform and opening up, when China really avoided direct confrontation, when even concert to what its public opinion wanted, China settled every dispute by actually compromising with the US. And among the, those who grew up in that era of US-China relations, there is a conviction, though not an entirely rational one, that if the Chinese are pressed hard enough, if they are intimidated hard enough, if you pound your fist on the table, they will eventually back down. This conviction does exist, hence you have to be tough with them, and this is the key to success. I suspect that this approach is a recipe for disaster, potentially, but it does exist. When we were communicating with our American colleagues in a coma, karma, atmosphere, I would sometimes ask them why they would say we like to scare the Chinese. It was considered perfectly normal. The Chinese are well aware of all this. Invo inwardly, they are seething. In my view, this is a rather dangerous situation in general. Not only the public at large demands that China should stop tolerating it, but also some in the military, the public service, and so on. Uh, thank you. Ivan, the same question to you. Yes, by the way, stop tolerating it, a phrase in Chinese, uh, China is not happy. We have been hearing these slogans in Chinese rhetorics in the 1990s. At the same time, I completely agree with Vasily that nothing much has changed. The stereotypes about the Chinese backtracking or giving a final warning uh, that is not followed by anything, these stereotypes date back to the 1950s and 1960s. Washington may well be acting rationally by pushing these main points, but we can suggest that it is not entirely rational to pressure China into imposing anti-Russian sanctions, given that the US has recently been putting pressure to bear on China itself. 
последние годы давили на Китай. Это торговая война. There is a trade war. China has been accused of genocide and COVID-19. просто мелкие пакости типа не приедут на. Some petty nasty things like not coming to the Beijing Olympics. It all creates the kind of atmosphere where the Chinese themselves say, "How much longer?" It's not working anymore. It's likely uh, that Washington has not thought this uh, through strategically. Or uh, take uh, today's report, which has rattled the internet, uh, that Biden said, yes, we are prepared to defend Taiwan. I don't remember the quotes in full right now, but the point is that it was seen by many in the media as some kind of qualitative change. In fact, I have to say the following. Firstly, Biden said nothing new. The same position has been expressed many times by American leaders. Uh, paradox paradoxically, it coexists with the recognition of a unified China. Washington says we recognize a united China China will recognize the People's Republic of China as the real China, but if there is any kind of action based on force against Taiwan, it will intervene. Generally speaking, a long-held position, one can see contradictions in it, one can see rationality in it, but nothing fundamentally new was happening here. And the second point is that Biden said one thing, but shortly after, the presidential administration clarified Biden's words once again, saying that nothing much was said. I think there is room for speculation. I would say, uh, spe speculation here about some personal characteristics. Uh, we have to understand that not all the actions and statements of the US diplomacy and the US leadership are sufficiently coordinated. They are not always strategically aligned. With all that said, if one assumes that everything the US president says is thoughtful and rational, one can try to explain it, try to find a motivation. So, on the one hand, Washington is showing to China that it cannot count on a scenario of annexing Taiwan by force. It can only count on a peaceful scenario. This is the kind of peaceful scenario that was possible in the old world before uh, 2022 or even before uh, 2018 in a world where we are in a state of confrontation but solve everything by compromise in a world where China is also changing a little bit. A peaceful reunification is quite possible. China wants, uh, if China wants to accomplish the historic mission of reunifying the homeland, let us return to the situation ante. This is how I see it. And the second point is quite possible that this is a message aimed at the United States quote allies. Uh, tomorrow there will be a summit of this organization in Tokyo, plus perhaps at other allies of the United States, showing that the United States is not leaving, the situation in Afghanistan will not be repeated. The US will honor its ally alliance commitments here. That may well be a kind of signal. In any case, it is a signal that should be assessed not as a prologue to a military operation, but in the context of international relations and the context of agreements between countries.